Okay. Uh, great, great to see such a wonderful crowd, our whole uh, auditorium uh, uh, packed with enthusiastic, bright uh, faces. Uh, I think at ICTS, it's uh, always a pleasure to have so many young people people around and uh, this is indeed a special occasion and I'm glad you took the trouble for trouble of coming all this way to come and hear uh, this wonderful lecture that we are going to have by David Tong. Uh, so for I'll just say a few words about ICTS in case you don't know. ICTS is a new center of the TIFR. Now, of course, we've been on this campus for eight years, uh, but uh, we have uh, a lot of outreach activities. I, I, I'm not sure how how many of you have heard of ICTS's Copy with Curiosity, Vigya Nadda? Uh, okay, uh, it's a fair number, but I'm sure uh, many more of you uh, uh, can uh, look that up. Uh, so we do a lot of outreach activities in science. We are a research institution. We have a lot of programs, uh, research programs, collaborative workshops, uh, etc. cetera. And uh, uh, right now there's one going on, in fact, essentially, on the theme of quarks and turbulence, uh, but uh, uh, but uh, we do a lot of public lectures. We do um, uh, many other outreach activities. The copy with curiosity is held at the planetarium, uh, and so it's easier for you folks to come. Uh, it's typically on a Sunday uh, afternoon every month. Uh, I think the uh, so you can look at our web page to. Uh, to uh, to get the notices. You can even subscribe to our uh, mailing list. Uh, that way you get the notifications for all these talks. Um, there, uh, there's something else called Vigya Nadda, which is aimed at undergraduate students. It's a, a, a copy with curiosity is sort of very much uh, for the lay public, but uh, Vigyanadda is goes a little more in depth by researchers talking about some specific areas, uh, new exciting areas of research. So that's online, and uh, once again, uh, uh, you can sign up for uh, being on the mailing list. If you go to the outreach section of our ICTS webpage, you'll see a list of all these other activities. I also want to. Uh, to announce that on uh, January 3rd, we'll begin the new year with uh, a public lecture by uh, Professor Sathya Prakash, who is actually here. Uh, it will be, it's the Vishweshara lecture that we have. Uh, maybe some of you might have come uh, for the inaugural Vishweshara lecture some years ago by Kip Thorne. Uh, uh, so uh, this is in that series. It is uh, uh, Vishweshara, Professor Vishweshara was the founder of the Bangalore Planetarium and a renowned astrophysicist. Uh, so we will be, we have been holding this lecture in his memory uh, and uh, Professor Sathya Prakash will be delivering uh, the latest installment and it will be on gravitational waves and uh, something uh, very complementary, very different uh, topic. So please come for that as well. Uh, please come for that event, January 3rd, Wednesday. Uh, so a couple of weeks down the line. Um, so, um, uh, so before, uh, so uh, let me introduce uh, the speaker today, uh, David Tong. So I'm sure all of you have seen his uh, remarkable videos on YouTube and so on. And so we're really fortunate uh, to have uh, David agree to give this lecture in public, uh, this public lecture in, uh, uh, in a stay here. So uh, David is one of those rare theoretical physicists, I think a rare breed these days who tries to span a lot of areas of physics in his research, in his teaching, and in, of course, in his outreach. So uh, uh, he he's worked, uh, he, uh, I, I don't know, I think he would just call himself a theoretical physicist and not a string theorist or a field theorist, or, uh, but he's worked on string theory, field theory, uh, condensed matter physics, uh, particle physics, uh, uh, cosmology, many, many areas in theoretical physics. And I think his, his ambition was to teach all the courses of theoretical physics at Cambridge. And, he, and over the years, he's done a fantastic job teaching them, uh, very innovative courses. And you'll see the, uh, you can find the course notes on his webpage. Uh, they cover 
area starting from classical mechanics, going to the string theory. Uh, and uh, very soon, uh, we'll have uh, the first four of them of the Tong series of theoretical physics, so to say. I mean, the, the first four volumes uh, will be coming out probably in a year from now. But uh, so, uh, especially for many of you undergraduates in the uh, physical sciences, uh, I think it'll be a great way to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to learn the subject through very many fun examples and, uh, and uh, with, uh, getting the concepts across. Uh, so, but you can look at his lecture notes in the meanwhile till the books come out. Uh, so uh, more formally, I think uh, uh, David did his PhD in 1998 Swansea and his connection to India came right after that. As he, I think he once said, he just hopped onto a plane and came off to Bombay uh, to be at the uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research uh, as a research fellow. And uh, he spent, I think, a very eventful year uh, there. And uh, as a result, he has been coming back to India many, many times ever since. So hopefully we'll have more of these public lectures. And he's uh, has come to ICTS since we've been here already a few times. After TIFR, he was at King's and at uh, MIT as a Papalado Fellow. And since 2004, he's been at Cambridge. Uh, and um, he's now a professor in the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics and a fellow of the Trinity College. And um, he... Uh, as I said, his research spans a number of areas, and he's been recognized for the research by a number of awards, I think, including the Adams Prize, a very the prestigious uh, prize for mathematicians in the, uh, given by Cambridge, the Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Award, uh, the, and as a Simons Investigator and an ESPRC New Horizon Award. These are some of the more recent awards uh, uh, in 2022, 2018, and so on. Uh, so, uh, so again, I would like to thank David for agreeing to uh, give this talk, and uh, now it's over to you. Thank you, Rajesh. Oh, uh, sorry, before that, uh, there's a small ceremony, a small gift on behalf of ICTS. There's a a small memento, a statue of the Buddha in sandalwood, Mysore sandalwood. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hello. How, how are you all? Um, Thank you, Rajesh, for that, that lovely introduction. I, I, these introductions, you're sort of your life flashes past your eyes in, uh, in, in 30 seconds, but uh, that, that was very nice. F firstly, um, th thank you so much to everyone for coming. I'm, I'm just blown away by the, by the number, of, uh, number of people here. Um, it, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to, to give this talk. It's also a real pleasure to be back in India for the first time in, I, I don't know, way, way too many years. Um, Rajesh mentioned this already, but uh, it's a little hard to believe. I first came to India 25 years ago. I was fresh out of my PhD and I took uh, a research position. You know, after you've done your PhD, you have to do a number of research positions before you get a faculty job. So my first research position was in TIFR uh, in Mumbai. Um, I, I think taking that job is one of the single greatest decisions I ever made in my life. I knew, but firstly, it was an easy decision because they were the only people who offered me a job. So that... <laughs> Pretty straightforward choice, um, but but uh, I, I'm going to TIFR was really the making of me as a as a scientist. It's it's one of many fantastic world class physics institutions that, that you have in this country with brilliant scientists, and I learned so much from the people there. Some of whom are uh, sitting in the front row, um, and on top of that, it also just cemented friendships that have now lasted a quarter of a century, which is the real reason that I keep coming back so often to India. So it's it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, what I wanted to do in this talk is tell you why we're here. And I don't mean that in some cosmic sense about why we're here. I mean why me and roughly 50 other scientists have traveled from all over the world to come to Bangalore uh, this week to, to discuss physics. Uh, there's a meeting this week, a, a physics conference, but, but it's a slightly unusual 
physics conference. So what usually happens in physics conferences is they're on some very specialized topic and one person after the other stands up and they, they present the calculations that they've been doing for the last six months and it's just huge technical detail. You, you sort of pretend that you're understanding what's going on, but really no human could possibly follow what, what pe people are doing. And, and this one's a little bit like that, if, if, if I'm honest, but it also has a slightly different theme to it. So the, the purpose of this week is, is a little unusual. What's happening is two groups of scientists who really don't know each other and, and really don't have any intersection but are working on very important topics, very important questions, very hard questions, as I'll, I'll try to get across, um, have come together to, to talk to each other just to see if there's any chance that there's some relationships and similarities between the questions that, that we're trying to address, just to see if maybe the toolkit that, that one set of scientists has built up to solve their problem might translate over and, and offer some opportunities uh, for people working on a, a very different problem. So it, it's, an, it's an interesting workshop. It's one of the most interesting I've, I've been to in a long time. Um, we're having many talks every single day, talking at each other. I think sometimes we're, we're talking past each other. Um, but, but everyone is trying. Everyone is trying hard to learn what the other side is, is, is doing uh, to see if there's some uh, commonalities that, uh, that, that, that can be shared. So I, I don't know what the outcome is going to be. Maybe there'll be some big spark that sets off some some new revolution, or, or maybe we just end up, you know, learning some cool physics and meeting some new friends, and that 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 would be okay as well. So, so that that's what's happening in this week, and I thought I'd just share with you um, what the problems are that, that we're trying to solve, because the the two problems that we the, the different groups are trying to solve are really two of, I think, the major open problems in in theoretical physics. The problems are what happens with quarks and and the problem of turbulence. So what I want to do mostly in this talk is, is just tell you what the problems are, just sort of set the scene, give you the big picture, um, and, and try to explain why the problem is hard, why after many, many decades of looking at both of these problems, we've still not, not solved them. And then at the end, I'm gonna speculate a little bit on, on, on possible ways in which, which they could be connected. The end will definitely be speculation, but, but most of this talk should be just, just standard science of things we should all know about uh, about these different areas. That's where we're going. I, I, I'll just talk for, I don't know, maybe it'll be an hour, may, maybe less, but th then I'll open it up and there'll be plenty of time to ask as many questions as you like about anything at all. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kick off j just by sort of giving you the big picture about what sort of questions we would like to ask in, in, in physics. And I'm going to do this by, by um, a quote from Richard Feynman. So uh, it, I, I expect most of you have heard of Richard Feynman. If, if you haven't, he was one of the great physicists of the last century. Um, among many other things, he wrote a series of three uh, textbooks that collectively are called the Feynman Lectures on Physics. Um, these, this is actually my copy of the textbooks. I, I took this photo bef before I came. Uh, these were the first textbooks I, I ever bought. I bought them when I was in high school, thinking that maybe I could read them and understand some physics before I went to university. Um, that, it turned out, was a terrible thing to do. And I, I don't know if you've read these, these texts, but if you want to learn physics, this is not the place to learn physics. Okay. If you already know physics, this is a brilliant place to learn more physics. But you know, Feynman is, is so idiosyncratic and explains everything in some slightly weird way and, and throws in just random tangents about how the human eye works and what a ratchet and pool is. I don't even remember what a ratchet and pool is. So there's all these kind of side of things he goes off on that, that make it very hard to actually learn. But as I said, once you know, you know, these tangents are really the delight of, of the book. So they're real gems if you already know physics. Uh, and on one of these many rants that he goes on, just going off on a tangent, he says the following. He says, often people in some unjustified fear of physics say, you can't write an equation for life. And then he elaborates on, on this a little bit. And he, he says that, that there's no fundamental equation that you can write down in physics that predicts, say, the existence of frogs or the existence of music, or the existence of something abstract, like, like morality or, or love, that these things don't seem to be included in, in the equations of physics. In other words, the things that are manifest in everyday life, the things that we care about day to day when we're not doing physics and solving equations, somehow those things don't seem to be in the equations of physics. And then he says, you know, actually, maybe they are. Maybe there is an equation that predicts frogs and love and, and music. Maybe this is the equation that predicts them. 
So um, I, I, I should, should say a few things here. For, firstly, I think there are going to be three serious equations in this talk. And if you don't know what these equations are, uh, please, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter at all. So uh, this particular equation, I put in a picture frame. Anything in a picture frame is, is there for two reasons. One, because the equation is utterly beautiful and beautiful things deserve to be in picture frames. Uh, and two, because it's telling you, don't worry if you don't understand it, you can just view it as a piece of art, which, <laughs> which it is. So that's, that, that's okay. So, so for those of you who don't know, that this is the Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is the fundamental equation that that describes what's happening in, in quantum mechanics. And Feynman says, you know, may, maybe love and frogs and morality and music, may, maybe it's all contained in the Schrodinger equation. Because if we write down a Schrodinger equation describing, you know, I don't know, a gazillion particles, 10 to the 30 particles interacting with certain forces, we, we don't think we've missed anything somehow. And so somehow out of this very, very simple equation, there should be complicated things. There should be frogs that emerge from from the Schrodinger equation. Now, of course, we, we don't know how to do it. We've got no idea how to get a frog emerging from the Schrodinger equation, let alone more abstract things like morality or, or love. But in principle, it's at least possible that these things are contained in this equation if only we could solve it. Now, um, in this talk, I don't want to talk about frogs and love and morality, um, but, but the general theme here is one that runs throughout physics. The fundamental equations of physics, without exception, are extraordinarily simple equations. I mean, sort of, for me, it's one of the big mysteries of physics. The fundamental equations are elegant and gorgeous and beautiful, and almost the simplest thing that you could write down within a particular framework. But while the equations are very simple, the solutions to those equations are immensely complicated. Just really very, very complicated. And some of them we understand, and some of them we just have no idea what, what's going on. And presumably, the frog is a solution to this equation, just one that we aren't able to, to, to solve or find because we're just, just not smart enough. So that, that's the a theme, as I said, that, that runs throughout physics. What physicists are very good at is finding simplicity in things. And very often, the equations that we write down to describe things are very, very simple. But what we're not good at is then extracting the immense complexity that those equations produce, or understanding the immense complexity that, that those equations produce. Because the equations, although simple, have very, very complicated uh, solutions. So we know some of this. We, there are some solutions that have taken decades for people to find and take many, many pages to fill in textbooks to, to write down. There are some solutions that humans can't find, but we have powerful computers, and computers can find. And there are yet other solutions to our equations that, that even the most powerful com computers can't, can't solve. So somewhere in this, we, we have to make sense of starting with simplicity and then understanding the complex and complicated behavior that, that emerges from this. And that's really the, the underlying problem when it comes to both quarks and, and to turbulence, as, as I will now explain. Both of them have very simple equations that describe them. And we cannot, or so far have not succeeded, in understanding the complexity that emerges from those equations to, to figure out what's going on. So that, that's the, 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 really the theme that connects the, the two topics. So what I'm going to do now is firstly tell you about quarks, uh, and then we'll move on and, and talk about turbulence, and then we'll see maybe how, how these things are connected. All right, so quarks. Um, let, let me set the scene. Hopefully this is, this is familiar to, to many of you. I see that, that there's someone very young here that maybe it's new to, but otherwise, uh, uh, hopefully it's familiar. Um, everything is made up of molecules, and molecules are made up of atoms, and atoms have a nucleus with a blurry cloud of electrons that, that orbits the nucleus. And uh, if you look more closely at the nucleus, the nucleus is made of protons and of neutrons, and if you look more closely at the protons and neutrons, each of them is made of three quarks. That last statement is a lie. And, and I, I, it's a white lie because we don't want to complicate things, but I, I find it awkward saying lies in physics. Each proton and neutron is really made up of many hundreds of quarks and antiquarks that are bubbling in and out of existence and doing very complicated things. And to simplify that, we lie and say it's made of three quarks. Really, there's, there's an extra three quarks rather compared to the antiquarks. But, but for the purposes of this talk, we're going to run with the lie and say that protons and neutrons are made of three quarks. And uh, that, that's where our knowledge stops. We don't know of anything more fundamental than an, elect an electron, and we don't know of anything more fundamental than quarks. As far as we're currently aware, these are the fundamental building blocks of matter. So these are the particles that, that you and I and everything in the universe is, uh, is made of. 
So um, there are two types of quarks uh, at, at play in the proton and electron. They, they have awful names. Uh, they're called the up quark and the down quark. I, and there's nothing up about the up quark and there's nothing down about the down quark. They, they're just, I, I think what honestly happened is in the 20th century, people stopped learning Greek and Latin at, at school. And it just sort of led to a failure of imagination when it came to naming new things. So, okay, we're, we're stuck with it. We've got the up quark and the down quark. The proton has two up quarks and a down quark, and the neutron has two down quarks and an up quark. And I hope I got that right. Very, very good. Um, there are other particles. There are many hundreds of other particles made of quarks uh, in various ways. They, they have names, baryons and mesons and various other names. So there are particles with, say, three up quarks. In them. The particle with three up quarks just doesn't last long. It, it decays very quickly back into protons and, and neutrons, but they exist in particle accelerators. All right, so, so this is uh, uh, the, the setting. Um, quarks are fundamental objects. There's a lot of things that we understand well about, about quarks. We have a, a fundamental theory uh, that describes quarks um, and, and their, their properties. It works extremely well, but among the many, many things we understand, there's one thing that stands out that I think we, we should understand better. Understand it partly. I think we should understand it better. And it's the following. Um, as far as we can tell, it's not possible to take a quark outside a proton or a neutron. They're, they're trapped there. Now, this is different from what happens for all, all the other particles. You know, the electrons and the protons and neutrons, they like to gather together into atoms. It's energetically favorable for them to get to gather together into atoms. They, they, they like to sit there. But if, we're, if we insist, it's not difficult to strip the electron or the proton or the neutron out from the atom. It's not at all possible to get a single electron and okay, maybe metaphorically ho hold it in your hand. And it, it, it's something that, that you can do. You cannot do that for a quark. It is not possible to take a single quark away from the other two in the proton and hold it there in your hand. Whatever the force is that holds quarks together inside the proton, and I'll tell you more about this force, it's so strong that it doesn't allow you to pull one quark out, no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you pull, it's not possible to get a quark out of a proton or, or a neutron. So that, that's a very striking state of affairs, and it feels like something we should understand better. And so what I'd like to tell you is, is what we do understand about this and, and also what, what we don't un understand about this. All right, so to put this in perspective, let, let me um, tell you about something simpler. The, the, the something simpler is the electric force. So ho hopefully this will, this will be familiar. Um, take two particles, one with positive electric charge and one with negative electric charge, hold them close to each other, uh, there will be a force between them. And because opposites attract, uh, these two things will, will feel a, what's called the Coulomb force that will, that will pull them together, the positive charge and, and the, the negative charge. Now, um, one of the great breakthroughs in, in theoretical physics was understanding that uh, there are objects called fields in the universe, and this was Faraday's great leap. It, it always amazes me that uh, one of the great theoretical breakthroughs in in physics was made by someone who left school at the age of 14 and really didn't know any mathematics at all. He was just an experimenter that had very, very good intuition for, for the way the universe works. So Faraday um, intuited that, that these things called electric fields should exist. And it's the electric field that communicates the force between, between these, these two particles. So you have a charged particle here, and it sets out some electric field which, which moves in space. And the other charged particle with the opposite charge feels this electric field, and it, it tells it what to do. And in particular, if they're opposite charges, they, they move together. Okay. So it's, it's one of the, uh, the standard first calculations you do in an undergraduate physics degree is to, is to uh, firstly compute the electric field coming out from these things, and then see how the electric field gives rise to this, this Coulomb force law. So ho hopefully vaguely familiar to... Uh, to many of you. There's a, an extra ingredient here, um, which I'll mention, but isn't normally uh, talked about in this context, which is that if you throw some quantum mechanics into the mix, in other words, you think of the uh, Coulomb force happening because of quantum mechanics rather than because of uh, uh, classical fields, the, the story is roughly the same. There are some few complications, but at the end of the day, in quantum mechanics, two uh, particles also feel this Coulomb force law. They also get, get attracted. Uh, force drops off as one over R squared, where R is the, the, the distance between them. But there, there is a slight novelty, and the novelty is going to be important as, 
as we go on. So in quantum mechanics, uh, the field between the two particles it isn't quite like, like it's drawn here. It, it jitters slightly in quantum mechanics. The field itself sort of uh, wobbles slightly. And you should think of that as a manifestation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So in, in quantum mechanics, you usually think of a quantum particle, and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says the particle can't be at a particular point in space because then its momentum is completely uncertain. And so instead, what you, the way you should think of a particle in quantum mechanics is as some blurry cloud of probability. And if you want to localize the particle there, it's just the cloud of probability is, is roughly in this, this spot, but not exactly in that, that spot. Now, th that story also holds for fields. So in quantum mechanics, strictly in quantum field theory, the field can't have a definite value. There's some probability that it has different values. And it turns out that in this particular case, the force of electromagnetism, the probability is very sharply peaked on the classical value. So it's not quite like this. There's a probability that the field looks slightly different, but only slightly different. The upshot is that the field is more or less the same in quantum mechanics as classical. All right, that, that's the electric force, something we understand extremely well. Um, let me move on and tell you about the force between quarks. All right, so we, we have a theory for the force uh, between quarks. Uh, the theory, well, the force itself is called the strong nuclear force. The strong nuclear force is what binds quarks together inside protons and neutrons. Uh, we have a theory for it. Uh, this year was the 50th anniversary of of this theory. We've known about this theory for a long time. The theory is called quantum chromodynamics, or, or QCD for short. So if, if you hear the phrase QCD, QCD just means the theory that describes the force between quarks. Uh, there is an equation for it. The equation is uh, lovely and gorgeous, and I probably should have it hanging on the wall of my house. It's this uh, uh, equation here. Um, for what it's worth, this term in the equation is, is due to Yang and Mills and describes the forces. And this term in the equation is due to Paul Dirac and describes the, the quarks themselves. So you've got two terms, the force uh, and the quarks. Uh, if we could solve this equation, we would understand everything about quarks and about the strong force and about the nucleus and about uh, nuclear matter. Sort of all of nuclear physics plus much more is just encoded in this equation. And it's our job to try and extract the answers from, from this equation. Let me tell you a little more, actually, about the strong force. The, the strong force is very, very similar in many ways to the force of electricity and magnetism. So you learn in school that, that the electric field is a vector. At every single point in space, there's, there's two vectors. There's an electric field that points in some direction, and there's a magnetic field that, that points in another direction. The electric field is called E, and the magnetic field is called B. And these electric and magnetic fields can vary both in their magnitude and in the direction that they point. The strong force has exactly the same form as that. There's an electric field that's sometimes called the chromoelectric field, and a magnetic field associated to it that's sometimes called the chromomagnetic field. And collectively, these things are called gluon fields. So the analog of the electric and magnetic fields in electromagnetism are gluon fields. And the equations that you write down for the strong force are exactly the same as the equations you write down for electricity and magnetism. And really, you, there's just a map from one to the other, and there's one small difference. And the one small difference is that uh, you have this vector, which is the electric field. Uh, for electricity and magnetism, each of these components of the vector, which points in different directions, is a number. And for the strong force, each of these components here is itself a three by three matrix. Slightly odd but that's the way it works. If you write down an electric field whose components are a three by three matrix, you have the theory of the strong force. That's all there is to it. Actually, there, there, there's a wonderful fact here that, that always strikes me as miraculous. There are three forces at play in, in particle physics, electricity and magnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. Uh, these, these three forces are associated to the numbers one, two, and three, respectively. The, the electric field, you have a number here, which is a one by one dimensional matrix. For the weak force, you have a two by two dimensional matrix here. And for the, the strong force, you have a three by three dimensional matrix here. Why, why nature chose the numbers one, two, and three for the forces, I don't know, but it's sort of obvious that they're the right ones you should choose in, in some sense. All right, so, so th this is the, the, the strong nuclear force. Um, 
And uh, actually, let, let, let me go back. Um, there's a, as I said, there's a lot we understand about it and a lot we don't. But the fact that uh, the components of this electric field are three by three matrices really changes the story dramatically when you try to solve the equations for this force rather than the equations for electromagnetism. So what happens when you try to solve the equations for the strong nuclear force um, is you find that the fields, these gluon fields, just go nuts. And they just go bonkers. They bounce up and down and they bounce wildly around. Uh, and we have no idea how to understand what they're doing. So, so to put this in perspective, uh, I'm going to do three different, different steps. F firstly, what we really want to understand is the force between two quarks, to understand why they're trapped inside protons and neutrons. Um, what I'm going to do here is first ask a slightly different question, which should be a much simpler question. It's what does empty space look like in the theory of the strong force? So what does that mean? I take a box. I take everything out of the box. And really, I just remove everything from the box until what's left is just the vacuum of space, literally nothing. And you ask, what does the vacuum of space look like? And this is the answer. So this is a computer simulation of absolutely nothing. This is a simulation done by uh, Derek Leinweber. He's a, a, he's called a lattice gauge theorist in, in Australia. Uh, it, it's, it's not just a cartoon. It's a proper simulation of QCD, the, the, the theory of the strong force, with nothing happening. This is the simplest solution you can have to the equations of, of the strong force. And what's going on here is, is you're, you're looking at the fields, the, uh, the gluon fields, the analog of the electric and magnetic fields. And while in... Um, electromagnetism, these fields are very well behaved. They're just sort of very flat and they jitter a little bit. Uh, when you get to the strong force, that's not the case. In the strong force, these fields just go wild. They're just shaking up and down in an extraordinarily complicated way. And if we want to understand the strong force, this is what we have to understand. And, and I should put my hand up. We do not understand this, this at all. It's just too complicated for us. So the, the strong force is, it is unusual, or the equations for the strong force are unusual. I, I said before that you have simple equations, and sometimes there are simple solutions, and sometimes there are complicated solutions. For the strong force, there are no simple solutions. The most simplest solution for the strong force is the vacuum of empty space, and this is what it looks like. It's something horribly complicated and messy. And our task is to understand, are there patterns in this mess somehow? Are there, are there some field configurations that appear more often th than others? just to somehow extract some physics from what's going on here, and we simply can't do it. And it's not quite true. We can simulate things on computers, but if we want to try with pen and paper to solve things, we just, we just are unable to. All right, so, so th this is empty space. The next question is, what happens if you put two quarks inside this maelstrom of fields bouncing up and down? Well, uh, again, we know the answer, but we only know the answer because we can do computer simulations to, to understand why. And this is what happens. So you take two quarks uh, inside these rapidly, wildly fluctuating quantum fields, the, these gluon fields. And, and what happens between is that the gluon fields um, form uh, um, well, what we call a flux tube, but what is best thought of as an elastic band. So it, it, it's, the, it's happening in the following way. If you go back to the, elect, uh, the story of electric charges, you put an electric charge there and an electric charge here, and the fields go off in all directions nice and smoothly, and, and they spread out. Um, the analog for the strong force is not that they spread out in all directions. It's that all the field lines all gather together uh, and sit in a, a straight line between the two quarks. So what you're looking at here, this sort of sausage-like shape in the middle it is the exact analog of those field lines spreading for electric charges, but it's field lines all collimated and all pointing in exactly the same direction to form something like an elastic band between, between the two quarks. A flux tube is the technical name. And, and so what happens is when you try to pull the quarks apart, it's like trying to pull an elastic band apart. It costs a lot of energy, a lot of force to, to pull these quarks apart. And this is why we can't get the quarks outside the the proton. But if you try to pull the quarks from outside the proton, uh, an elastic band forms, and it becomes very, very hard to, to pull them out. Um, th this is for two quarks. Strictly speaking, th this picture is for a quark and an antiquark. 
but something very similar is there for the proton. So again, th this is a computer simulation. You take a proton, uh, you can't do it in real life, but in a computer, you can ask what happens if you pull the three quarks in a proton far apart from each other. And what you find is that if you pull these three quarks apart, uh, a, a sort of tripod shaped elastic band forms out of the gluon fields and uh, um, pulls the quarks back together. So this is the reason why we can't uh, um, uh, take quarks outside of, uh, of the proton. So th this phenomenon is called confinement. Uh, the fact that quarks are trapped inside a proton, the fact that, that we can't get them out. Um, as I said, we do not understand it very well, except we have computer simulations, and computers tell us what, what happens. So that's the understanding of, uh, of quarks. There's something else to tell you here, so, something, uh, and uh, I will put equations that aren't in pretty pictures on, on the next slide, um, which is quantitatively how this happens. And it's interesting to compare what happens for electric charges and, and what happens for quarks. So what, what, what's the story? If you have two electric charges, there's an electric field between them. The force goes as one over R squared. That's the Coulomb force, where R is the separation. Uh, but the electric field stored, sorry, the energy stored in the electric field is proportional to one over R, the separation between, between the, the the, the electric charges. So if you move the electric charges far away, R gets bigger, the energy stored goes down. It doesn't cost much energy to pull two electric charges apart. But for quarks, it's the opposite. Because of this formation of this flux tube or this elastic band, as you pull two quarks apart, the energy needed to separate them gets bigger and bigger as you pull them apart. So in fact, the energy goes, grow, grows with R, it grows linearly with R. So as you can see here, the energy is proportional to R for quarks and the strong nuclear force, as opposed to one over R for, for electric charges. So um, what, what's happened here? We start with a very, very simple equation, equation for QCD, the one I put in a, in a picture for you. And we're not smart enough to solve it, uh, but that's okay. There's lots of equations we're not smart enough to solve. We get computers to solve it, and they show us that there's this horrible mess of uh, vacuum fields bouncing up and down and flux tubes forming between quarks. And it all feels you know, terribly messy and complicated, but at the end of the day, there's an answer that's extremely simple. And the answer that's simple is that the energy it takes to pull two quarks apart uh, grows linearly with the distance between the quarks. Now, you know, if the answer was complicated, I, I wouldn't care. I just say computers are smarter than we are, and that, that's fine. It's all right that they solve it and, and we can't. But the answer is so simple. And it feels like there must be a way for us to understand why this is the case, why, why quarks uh, experience this, this linearly growing force. See, it would be lovely for me to stand here and give you an explana explanation for why quarks experience this linearly growing force, where the explanation isn't just, well, the computer says that's, that's the case. But, but at the moment, that, that's all we have. We have lying a bit, we have a few heuristic ideas, but, but really that's the only uh, strong evidence we have that this happens is computer says so. And it, it would be much nicer to, to understand you know, genuinely what, what's going on. You know, there's, there, there's a dictum in physics. There's a dictum that says, you don't really understand anything until you can explain it to your grandmother. Um, I, I've never subscribed to this. I, I, I loved my nan, but it didn't matter how simple I made something, she was never going to understand anything about, about. She, she'd say, that's very nice, dear, would you like, like another chocolate biscuit? Um, but it, it is true that sometimes in physics, it, things just feel unsatisfying. You know, you have an answer. Here, the answer is computer says so. But, but it, it just sort of feels like you should have a more intuitive understanding for what's actually going on to explain something. This is one case where we do not have that intuitive understanding. And it's been 50 years of people trying, people trying and making progress. There's always progress, but, but still nothing definitive that, that we can say. So I, I said there were two big problems that, that this meeting, the people in this meeting work on. One of them is this and, and some related problems. But, Basically, one of them is this. Why are quarks confined inside the proton? And how do we understand this very simple result that the energy is proportional to the distance between two quarks, starting from first principles and without just using horrible 
horrible numerics. It's an open problem. It's one of the major unsolved problems in theoretical physics. I invite you all to come and join us in the quest to, uh, to try and solve it. All right, that, that's where I'm going to leave quarks. Uh, I'm going to move on now and talk about, uh, about turbulence, which is the other problem that, that we have. So uh, turbulence um, it is a very, very different kettle of fish. It's a very different area of physics. Uh, and everything you want to know about turbulence is contained in this equation. So this is uh, one of the great equations of theoretical physics. Uh, there are really two preeminent equations uh, of classical physics. One is Einstein's equations of general relativity that describe gravity, and the other one is this. This is the Navier-Stokes equation, and it describes fluids. Um, what, what should you say? What's a fluid? A fluid is anything that's a liquid or a gas, roughly speaking. So anything that's a liquid or a gas, the way it moves is described by this equation here. Uh, it, it's got a, a variable u, U is the velocity of the fluid. And so this equation tells you how the velocity of the fluid changes over time. Okay? Uh, it's a very important equation. Uh, it's also a very old equation. So the, the first three terms here were written down over 250 years ago. This last term is, is much more recent. This last term was written down 201 years ago. Uh, it, it was first written down by uh, Navier. Navier was, um, I only learned this recently, Navier was a French engineer. Um, but he was a French engineer that loved mathematics much more than he loved engineering, which turned out to be uh, perhaps not the best thing to do if, if you're a, an engineer. So um, he rose in the ranks of engineering in France, and he became the chief bridge builder in, in France. And he, he was tasked with building France's best ever bridge, some fancy suspension bridge over the Seine, right in the middle of Paris. In fact, he boasted it was going to be for the glory of France, the greatest bridge ever built. He also boasted um, that he was using the latest in modern mathematics, where the latest in modern mathematics meant Fourier analysis. You, know, you might be seeing where this story is going. It, it turns out that, that Fourier analysis is really no substitute for concrete. Uh, he, he took two years to build the bridge, and two weeks before it was first to open, the first cracks showed in the bridge, uh, and it was torn down before anyone ever, ever crossed it. So, so that, that's Navier's legacy. But, but in addition, in his spare time, he, he made one of the great contributions to physics, which, which is he, he wrote down this term here. So, so what, what, what is this equation? That this equation is basically F equals ma for a fluid. The, the, uh, the terms on the left is the acceleration of the fluid, and the terms on the right are two forces. This is the force due to pressure, this capital P here is pressure, and, and this is a force due to some friction as one piece of the fluid rubs against the other. Uh, it's called the viscosity term. This, this new here is, is viscosity. So it, it's a reasonably simple equation. It's a version of F equals MA. Um, by the way, you might be wondering what Stokes is doing. I, I'm not qu quite sure why Stokes is there. Stokes was the fifth person to write down this term. So it's not quite clear to me why Stokes gets his, his name on this equation, but okay, it's, it's called the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, what, why is it important? It's important because in certain regimes, this equation describes everything in the universe. And I, I mean that li literally. Uh, take anything at all, any substance, and throw it in a box, throw a bunch of it in a box, and heat that stuff up until it melts. And it doesn't matter what you started with, the stuff in the box will move, and the way it moves will be described by this equation. Okay? So for example, there are what 100 and so elements in the periodic table. You can take an inert gas, or you can take one of the alkaline earth metals. If you throw them in the box, and you make sure they're in the liquid or the gas phase, both of those substances, no matter what you started with, are going to be described by, by this equation. Okay? It's a remarkable statement. You know, if you're doing an undergraduate degree in physics, that's four years of your life learning about all the different things in the universe and all the different properties. But in a certain regime, all of those differences disappear. Everything acts in the same way. It, in fact, it's even more impressive than, uh, um, than I've said. You can take very exotic substances. So uh, about 20 years ago, physicists succeeded in making protons and neutrons melt. So what, what does that mean? That this flux tube between quarks, if you heat it up to a high enough temperature, so I don't know what those temperatures are, like a gazillion Kelvin or, or something, but if you heat it up to high enough temperatures, that flux tube melts. And when the flux tube melts, the, the quarks are actually free to roam around. 
So 20 years ago, experimenters succeeded for the first time in 13 billion years in freeing quarks from their prison of protons and, and neutrons. And they formed a new state of matter called the quark gluon plasma in which quarks were roaming around freely in some hot environment. The quark gluon plasma lasted a, a, a fraction of a, a second, but in that fraction of a second, it moved. And the way it moved was described by this equation here with some relativistic embellishments, but basically this equation here. So it's an astonishing equation. Actually, there's one more thing I'll tell you. Um, one of Stephen Hawking's great discoveries is that black holes are hot. If you take a black hole, it, it emits heat. Not very hot, but nonetheless, it, it, it emits heat. So, said another way, you can think of a black hole as a way to heat up space and time, whatever that means. Black hole is a way to heat up space and time. So some years ago, physicists, most of them here in India, led by Shirazmin Waller and others in, in TIFR, understood that the event horizon of a black hole um, should be thought of as some fluid-like substance. And if you drop something into a black hole, the event horizon ripples, and they showed that the way the event horizon ripples is governed by this equation here. So it, it's utterly remarkable. I and mean, this equation really describes everything in the universe, and it's important that we understand it for, for that reason. All right, so, so what, what's, the, what's the setting? Um, there, there, are, there are some things about this equation we understand beautifully. You can take courses on fluid mechanics in your undergraduate degree. I urge you to do so. It's, it's a gorgeous subject. But there are many things about this equation that we do not understand. Uh, here is a question that we don't understand about this equation. It's an unbelievably simple question. You take a pipe, and you make water flow through the pipe, and you want to ask, how much pressure should I force uh, on the end of the pipe to make the water flow. It's hard to think of a simpler question than that about, about fluids. We don't know the answer to that question. Okay? That's how hard this equation is to solve. I, I, should, I should clarify that a little bit. If the flow of the water is slow, it's very easy to compute the pressure. It's about three, three lines of equations. You, you can do it very easily. But what happens is as you force the water to go faster and faster, the water starts to wobble. And then those wobbles get bigger and they get bigger until finally the water is just going nuts and swirling around all over the place. That's the turbulent phase. And at that point, we just don't understand anything about, about the water. Um, the, the lovely thing about fluid mechanics is it's a very visual subject. You can show videos. And you can't do that for quarks or general relativity. You can show videos for fluid mechanics. So let, let me show you a, a, a video of this. Um, let me firstly tell you what you're looking at here. This is a pipe. It has water flowing through it. The water is going to go that way. Uh, there's this weird black line through the middle. That, that's because there's a guy at the end here, just off the camera, dropping some ink in the water. Uh, and so what you're seeing with this black line is, is the ink moving with the water and therefore showing you the water, the, the way the water is, is, is flowing. Um, so what's happening at the moment? The flow is very slow. The water is just flowing in a straight line. And the fact this is just a uh, uh, this ink just moves in a straight line, is, is capturing that. So I'm going to press play. And as I press play, the water will speed up and speed up. And as we speed up, as we get faster and faster, we'll see what becomes of, uh, of this line here. All right, so you can see as you speed up, it starts to wobble. But the wobbles are rather small. They're just some small perturbations. And then they get bigger. They get, seem to get frozen in the liquid at, at this point. And then as you go faster and faster, you, you can see that the ink is losing coherence. It's diffusing in, in the fluid. It's no longer a clear line at all. And then finally, as you get fast enough, it just seems like all hell breaks loose. I, it, it's not at all clear that there's a there's some clear stream of ink. It's being buffeted all over the place by, by this turbulent water just swirling around. The question is, how can we understand this behavior of, of the fluid in the, the turbulent phase? Um, Here's another uh, video. This one is not a, an experiment. This one is a simulation. Um, yeah, it'd be nice to have the lights low for this. That, thank you. Um, so, so let me explain what you're seeing here. This is a computer simulation of a fluid moving from, from left to right, and there's an obstacle that's been put in the way. The obstacle is just this square that sits here. And as it moves, we're going to start to see what, what happens to the fluid as it, as it goes past the, uh, the square. So th there's a bunch of things to, to look at here. You, in particular, you can see there's there's some nice coherent structures. There are these vortices or, or eddies 
uh, which sort of appear fairly regularly as, uh, as you move past. Th this is pretty well understood. It's called the von Kármán vortex street for, for what it's worth. But as you zoom in, you can see that there's, there's much more going on here. There's structure within the structure. There's big swirls and there's little swirls. And the big swirls sometimes disappear and sometimes they take off and have a life of their own like, like this one. And the question of turbulence is to somehow get a, a handle on what's going on with this very, very complicated structure. And again, it's not something we can solve by, by hand. Uh, it's something where, um, at least on the level of solutions, we're relying on computers and uh, serious numerical simulation to, uh, to get a handle on it. But we'd like to understand what's going on with this. And, and you know, it's, it's so complicated, it, it's not even clear what questions we should be asking. It's not like we can ever hope to write down a solution that looks like this. That, that's way too much. So, so it feels like probably we should treat this in some probabilistic sense, in some statistical sense. So the kind of questions that people ask are the following. So suppose that you know this bit of the fluid has velocity in that direction. What, what's the probability that the neighboring piece of fluid has the same velocity? Or what's the probability that the neighboring piece of fluid has a velocity that points in a slightly different direction? And, and how do those probabilities change as you separate the two points? That, that's the kind of question we would like to ask, and, and even better, like, like it's easier to ask than to answer, really would like to, to answer it. Uh, other questions. Um, swirling is clearly a big part of this story. You could just see there were, there were swirls everywhere. What, what's the distribution of swirls? Are big swirls more likely than little swirls? When big swirls disappear, what, why are they disappearing? Are they breaking up into little swirls? What are those little swirls they're, they're doing? Again, th this is the kind of question that we would, uh, we would like to ask. It's been a very serious question for probably 100 years since uh, um, turbulence research started seriously. And as with quarks, we've made progress in that time. We've understood some things, but there's still a lot that we do not understand about uh, very simple properties of fluids when they, 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 they flow very fast. In fact, being an outsider to this subject, it, it's sort of noticeable that, that uh, the great breakthrough happened in the 1940s. The, the, the great Russian polymath, Kol Kolmogorov, who, who made many pioneering contributions to you know, number theory and probability and computer science, he, he really understood the, the, the structure uh, of turbulence in the best way that we have so far. This has been 80 years, and there's been many, many, pro much progress in 80 years, but it's, it's clear that this Kolmogorov theory from 80 years ago is still the one that stands tall as the, uh, the most important contributions to, to turbulence. It's even even looks like much of it isn't right. It's just the best we have at, at the moment because it's a hard problem. All right, so um, this is the question of, of turbulence. How do we under, understand this? Uh, we've seen the, the question of quarks. And so let me tell you what we're doing here. Why, why, why do we think that people who care about quarks have anything to say to, to people that, that care about fluids and, and, and turbulence? Um, and the idea is that, that perhaps... Um, there's some relationship between these, these two phenomena. So you can see that, you know, very roughly, if you, if you really squint, it, it looks like maybe they're the same. Both of them have fields that are doing complicated things. This. Um, they're not equal to each other. I and mean, these are different equations that, that we're solving. So they're definitely not the same problem. I, you know, I didn't put an equal sign here. This squiggle symbol has a a precise meaning for mathematicians, but for physicists, it's a really useful symbol. It means the thing on the left looks vaguely like the thing on the right. Uh, and, and that's sort of the question we're asking. Do these two things look roughly, and we don't even know if, if they're roughly the same, but, but at the very least, it, it's sort of clear that the toolkit that you might have to understand the fluctuating quantum fields might be similar to the toolkit you need to understand the fluctuating fluids. Talking about probabilities in, in both cases, there are some very clear differences. And the, the probabilities for the quantum fields are inherent quantum probabilities because quantum mechanics is not a deterministic theory. Whereas the probabilities for the fluids is because of chaotic behavior of the fluids because we just don't understand well enough what's happening and because uh, sensitive uh, behavior to, to initial conditions. So, so everything, is, lots of this is, is different, but the hope is that maybe there's enough similarities to. Um, uh, certainly for us to talk to each other and maybe for us to learn from each other as well. Um, I, I have to say that my impression is, so it's, it's only been two and a half days of the conference. I, I missed today, uh, two days of the conference. But my impression is that um, 
the toolkits we have are actually remarkably similar. Um, I, I was quite surprised, actually. We're sort of really talking the same language in, in the both cases. I, I don't know if that's because we've both found the right toolkits or just because humans have a lack of imagination when it comes to, to new things. But, but, but certainly, you know, I, I, as far as I can tell, it, people are able to talk across these, the, these two communities. Um, let me end with something that I think is a little bit speculative, but, but for me at least has been one of the highlights of, of this meeting. So it's something that's come out only in the last couple of years, um, but suggests that there might be more to this connection between what's happening on the left-hand side and what's happening on, on the right-hand side. And so this, uh, this new thing, which may be completely unimportant in the big scheme of things, or, or maybe a great breakthrough, um, uh, it's called the area law. So, so I'm going to tell you about the area law for quarks and then the area law for, uh, for turbulence. So the area law for quarks is something that we've understood for a long, long time since, since, uh, um, since, since the 1970s. And it's the following. Uh, this is a space-time diagram. Uh, take a quark and an anti-quark, and originally they can be together, and just pull them apart, and then put them back again. Okay? And ask what happens when, when you do that. And in particular, how much energy does it take to pull them apart and put them back again? So, so what happens? Well, um, we know from what I said earlier that the quark and anti-quark have a flux tube between them. And so here's the flux tube just at... Uh, some particular time when they're as far apart as possible, and that this flux tube costs energy. The energy is proportional to the distance between here and here. But of course, the flux tube was there for all time. It's not just there when they're far apart. There's always a flux tube. The flux tube is growing as you pull them apart and then shrinking again. So the better picture is the following, that, that actually the flux tube between the, the quarks first grows and then shrinks. And you can ask sort of what's the integrated energy it costs to to do this. Uh, for those of you who know, a slightly better way of saying this is about the action, but I, I'll, uh, um, if you don't know what the action is, uh, don't worry. Um, what you do is you, you just multiply the energy times the time. So the, the, the energy is uh, at every point proportional to the distance between them. So what you get when you compute the integrated energy is actually the area uh, of this, this green oval. So there, there's uh, the area law for QCD or for quarks is, is, for physicists, synonymous with the idea of confinement. It's just a way of capturing the fact that the, the energy grows linearly, and for reasons that I, I won't get into, it turns out to be slightly easier to talk about the fact that uh, this thing called the action is proportional to the area that, that you sweep out. And the nice thing is that it, it doesn't matter what path the particles take. If they take some complicated path like this, and then you bring them back together, there's some minimal surface, a bit like a, a, a soap bubble uh, that fills uh, uh, th that curve, and it's that minimal surface, which it's the area of that minimal surface, which is the answer that you get. Okay, so there's something in quarks that is to do with the area of things that, that, that move around. Um, the new thing that, that, that happened only in the last uh, few years um, is, is that there's suggestions that there's something very similar um, in turbulence. So the suggestion was made by Professor, Professor Migdal, who is sitting down here, and uh, the, the work of the last few years is uh, by professors Kartik Ayer and Katapili Srinivasan and P.K. Jung. Uh, two of them are also uh, sitting down here. And the, the idea is the following, that um, you compute what's called the circulation. I have a complicated equation at the top there that's not in a picture frame. But, but basically, you, you take the velocity and you integrate the velocity around the curve C. And what these uh, very impressive numerics from a few years ago show is that the probability uh, for the circulation around any given curve only depends on the area that, that fills the curve. Now, um, two areas, in, in two different theories. Um, what to say? The, the connections between this, I think, are a little closer than they maybe appear at the level I'm, I'm giving this. In, in fact, Sasha Migdal was inspired by the ideas from, from quarks and QCD to propose that this area law might be... Uh, um, uh, might also hold in fluid mechanics. So, um, as I said, it, it's speculative. You know, honestly, I, I don't know if this is a great breakthrough or if it'll just be a, a dead end. If you ask Professor Migdal, he'll tell you it's a great breakthrough, but um, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. But, but that, that, that's just the way physics works. You know, we're always chasing dead ends in physics, and some of those dead ends turn out not to be dead ends, but actually to be exactly the idea you need to, to make progress. So, for me, this has been exciting 
uh, to learn about, and I, I thought I'd share it with you as just an example of the kind of ideas uh, uh, that we're playing with uh, at this conference. All right, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello. Yeah, thanks a lot, David, for that uh, really stimulating talk and uh, bringing together these two different areas and connecting them by, with an area. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, so you can see, I mean, the unity of physics, in a sense, or at least physicists trying to find unity in physics, uh, I think, in these two different, uh, very different topics. So uh, I'm sure there are questions. Uh, please wait. Um, some mics will come to you. And uh, please keep your question short to the point uh, uh, and, uh, uh, so that we can have many more of them. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. The first question is up there. Uh, uh, hi. I did understand why there should be uh, those fluctuations when it's vacuum. So I couldn't understand that. And in turbulence, if you are able to solve that equation, what are some of the practical applications that we already can't do in wind tunnels, for example, because we can simulate it numerically and through experimentation. So what is the advantage of solving the theoretical equation? Ah, very, very good. So um, yeah, let, let me try and address the, the first one. Um, what's the right way? The, the, the fluctuations are a useful visualization, but, but also a little bit mi misleading. So the risk of confusing you more, let, let me try and explain a more honest picture of, of, of what's going on. But we'll start with a particle. So a particle in classical mechanics has a definite point. But in quantum mechanics, uh, particles are some blurry probability smeared over some, some region. The same is true of fields. So uh, the field in the vacuum would, let, let's do um, electricity of magnetism. The field in the vacuum would just be the, the electric field and the magnetic field is zero everywhere. It's a really easy solution. In quantum mechanics, that's not the solution. The solution is, well, they have some probability to be zero, and they have some probability to be like this, and they have some probability to, to take some other configuration. And every single configuration of fields, you have to assign a probability to. So even in electricity and magnetism, when you take quantum mechanics into account, in the vacuum, in the ground state, there's a probability that the electric field is doing this. Very, very tiny probability, but it's a small probability nonetheless. So you should think of, in particle mechanics, we talk about wave functions. That's the probability distribution. It, for fields, you should also talk about something like a wave function, but for the field. You, sp you, give, the, you give the wave function the entire field configuration. It sp spits back a single number, which tells you the probability that you're in that. So, so what happens for electricity and magnetism is the probability that um, you're in a very flat configuration in the vacuum is very, very high. And for the gluon fields, for, for QCD, the probability that the fields are zero in the vacuum is very, very low. The, these kind of wildly fluctuating ones are, are the ones that have a high probability in, in the ground state, in, in the vacuum. So that, that's a slightly more honest but less visual way of saying it. Does that yeah, yeah. answer your question? So the, 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 the second one was um, on the engineering side. Um, there's a, there's a facetious answer to this, which is I really don't care. Um, so the, <laughs> there's... A, <laughs> You know, I, one of the nice things about turbulence is different communities do it because they care about different things. And, and if you want to understand, you know, how jet turbines work and the best way to build an airplane wing and, you know, things like this, th these are important problems. And of course, if they're really important, we figured out other ways to, to solve them. We do numerical simulations, we do experiments in, in wind tunnels, but there are limitations to those. And if you just solve something, you've solved it for, for good. Um, but there are these other issues about turbulence, which, which I do care about because I'm a completely impractical person, which, which are more at the fundamental level. How should we understand the physics of, of what's going on here? Uh, the, the fact that you know, this may actually have practical spin-offs is of huge interest to some people and little interest to me. Thank you. Question here. 
after that, we come to the person in blue there. Uh, yeah. Hi. So, hi, I'm Mana. Uh, my question is, uh, we talked about the flux tube. So what happens if you have a flux tube at the event horizon of a black hole and you know you have a quark gluon plasma, right? And the area diagram, how does that change? Oh, so, that, 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 that's a great question. Um, <laughs> so so I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to tell you without writing the, the, the equations. The, the area does change because areas get distorted around, around a, a black hole. But what really happens, and I, maybe you're thinking about one quark being inside the black hole and one quark outside, Oh, for Hawking radiation. I, I see. No, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna have to think. <laughs> so what? Yeah, what happens? So, so outside the black hole, Hawking radiation will, will be emitted, uh, and what will come out are, are not individual quarks, but quarks and antiquarks attached by the flux tube. That, that, that's what will, will emerge. Yeah, it's not like you're gonna get one coming out and one going in. Uh, that will fall back in. Uh, I'm nervous because sitting behind you is the world's expert on black holes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Ashok. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, so my question is that you told me that uh, there's a flux tube between two quarks. Yes, sir. But in the in the nucleus, there is three quarks in the proton and three quarks in the ne uh, neutron. And uh, there must be a flux tube between the quarks of the proton and the neutron. Oh, I see. Yes, it's another and great question. And why does it not like collapse into one singular particle? Yeah, that, that, so that's not what happens. So, so what, what happens is, is kind of wonderful, actually. Um, the, the strong force acts twice. Now, let me tell you what I mean by this. Firstly, it binds quarks together, three of them, uh, inside the proton and three inside the neutron. So three is a happy family when it comes to, to quarks. That, that's the right number. Four doesn't work. Three, three want to, to be together. Then in addition, it binds quarks and antiquarks into particles called pions. Okay. It's an example of a meson. We discovered them in 1947. They've been known for, for a long time. So, so what happens is the, is the following. Um, firstly, it binds the quarks into particles, protons and neutrons. It binds other quarks into pions, but those pions then act as force carriers that bounce between the proton and neutron, binding them together. So the, the reason protons and neutrons bind together is due to the strong force, but it's kind of a secondary effect of the strong force. It's not flux tubes, it's, it's uh, th these new particles called pions that are doing the job. So pions act as uh, force carriers? Yes, maybe. exactly, yes. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, first we'll we take from the person right at the back and then the person somewhere here. Um, so there is another quite interesting problem of the existence of solutions for the Navier-Stokes. So, so if we, we were able to solve this problem of the existence of solutions for Navier-Stokes, would that help us in any way to solve the problem of turbulence? I, I, think, I think the answer is, is no in, in one sense. That suppose you just prove that... Um, so first, I should fill everybody in. There's a big open problem that's very closely related to turbulence. You, you start with some uh, initial data in a fluid. You let it evolve through the Navier-Stokes equations. The question is, does that solution become singular anywhere? Do you get an infinity in the solution at some point in, in, in the evolution? Um, something like a shock wave, for example, would, would, would be singular in a fluid. So if, if the answer to that question is no, and you can prove that the, the answer is no, then it's possible the tools you used to prove that may also be helpful to, to solve turbulence. But if that's not the case, I don't think that helps you solve turbulence. Okay. If, however, the answer is yes, that you, you do get singularities in a finite time, then I think that's surely important for turbulence. We have to understand the role those singularities are, are playing. Okay, thank you. So what I would like to ask is if, if it's actually that electrons exist in a cloud and we can't de really define where electrons will be in one particular moment, why is it still thought that uh, the, the electrons orbit the nucleus? That's not a bad question. Um, <laughs> so what, 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 what happens? Did you say electrons in a flower to be 
to begin with? In the cloud. Oh, in the cloud. So, sorry, can you say the, the, the question again? If, the, the, yeah, say the question again. <laughs> My question is, if electrons are really in a cloud yes. around the nucleus and we can't uh, really define the position of it on a particular moment, was it taught that the electrons orbit the nucleus? Oh, I, I see. Th thank you. I, I misunderstood the first question. This is also a great question. So, so you know, th there's a view of the atom like a solar system. So the, the solar system has, has the sun in the middle and then the planets orbiting around in, in various orbits. You know, the, the, the picture I think that we had at the beginning of this talk was it was exact, exact. That's a terrible picture of an atom. I mean, that, that's an absolutely awful picture of, of the atom. So, so what happens is the electrons don't have a definite position. They, they don't go on specific orbits. Instead, they spread out as, as clouds of probability. The simplest one is just a sphere uh, everywhere around, around the, the nucleus. The other ones have more interesting peanut-like like shapes. Um, so the reason we call them orbits is just sort of clinging to uh, our old language somehow. But this is what an orbit means in, in classical mechanics. It's not like a, sorry, in quantum mechanics. It's not like a planet going around. It's some smeared uh, cloud of probability. Thank you for the question. Okay. Yeah. Hi, over here. <laughs> Where are we? Uh, here. Oh, hi. So I was wondering if there is a, if turbulence can say something about the mass gap and if there are any development about it. And that, that's that's sort of the, the main purpose goal. of this this workshop. So, so for everybody, I should um, I, I should say that, that the mass gap is uh, something else related to the strong force and, and QCD that, that I didn't mention. It's very closely related to confinement. So, so what happens is the following: in electricity and magnetism, there are ripples of the electric magnetic field, and, and that's called light. And if you look closely at light, you see it's made of photons, and famously, the photon is massless. Now, the equations of the strong force look very, very similar to, uh, to those of electricity and magnetism. There are ripples of this field. Uh, the ripples of that field, if you look very close, are called gluons. It's a particular particle. And if you just solve the equation naively, it looks like the gluon should be massless. But it turns out it's not. And it's not for a very similar reason to confinement that quantum effects kick in and everything just, just goes wild and crazy. The fact that the gluon gets a mass is called the mass gap problem. Uh, it, it's, it's something else I could have talked about in, in, instead of confinement. It's, again, one of the major open problems in, in quantum chromodynamics. Does it have a connection to turbulence? And yeah, that's sort of what we're here this week to, to find out. Not an obvious one, but, but maybe there's something there. Thanks. So I have a question. So you said that uh, for Navier-Stokes equation, uh, it does not depend on the details, means whether this, it, it can cause in uh, quark gluon plasma or water or everywhere. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the strong forces are very specific. So uh, why there, how we are connecting these two, one is an emergent phenomena and another is very fundamental or specific. You know, the, the question of what's fundamental and what's emergent is, is time dependent. You know, in, in 200 years time, we could easily understand what's underneath the quarks and, and the, uh, uh, the strong force that, that sits there could easily be, appear to be emergent, just, just, just like Navier said. In fact, a, a much better example is Einstein's equations of general relativity. Th these are the moment we think of fundamental equations of nature. Uh, many people working on quantum gravity think that actually we should view them exactly the same as the Navier-Stokes equations, that, that there's some fundamental quantum thing underneath, and when you understand the complicated dynamic, what emerges is, uh, is the equations that govern space and time. So I, I, I'm not sure we should, you know, the word fundamental is loaded and, and de depends on where you are in history. So I think we should appreciate this fact. Just, uh, let me take, uh, we'll come back, uh, let me uh, take some questions from the YouTube. Uh, so, uh, so Aruna Harikant asks, how accurate are simulations, presumably in turbulence, uh, or maybe even the QCD case, compared to the natural phenomena? No. I, I, I only learned this on Monday. <laughs> so, so on Monday, I went to lots of lovely talks about turbulence, and, and they have error bars. Um, and so I, I, I'm not quite sure what, what more I could, I could say other than that. But I, you know, 
the results for Turbidance seem to me to be very trustworthy and the people doing it be very good. Um, we, we believe that these simulations are an accurate representation of what's really happening in, uh, in turbulent flows. Uh, uh, Rupesh asks, why does the strong force have a different equation? Why doesn't the Schrodinger equation capture quark dynamics? Oh, this is such a good question. I've been sweeping all of this under, <laughs> under the carpet. So, so the, the, the story is the, the following. Um, uh, you, you, have, you have many different uh, systems in, in physics. There, there, there's, there's, what do I mean by this? Many different equations. Of it. There's a Maxwell equation that describes electricity and magnetism. And there's a Dirac equation that describes electrons. And there, there's the equation for the strong force. Uh, and all of these are equations which should, should be fed into the Schrodinger equation. And by feeding them into the Schrodinger equation, you're, you're doing quantum mechanics with that system rather than classical mechanics. So, so the, the thing that I put up there, uh, the equation for the strong force, um, you, you can do one of two things with it. You can either feed it into the Schrodinger equation to make it quantum mechanics, or you can feed it into Feynman's path integral which is an equivalent to the Schrodinger equation. So you have to feed this into the Schrodinger equation. Somehow it's the combination of the two that you want to solve. Uh, we'll take one more question maybe from here before we come back to the audience. Um, so Parth Patil asks, uh, with a certain amount of energy, we should be able to, I assume he is thinking of uh, saying, pulling, pull out a quark to such length scales where calling it a proton doesn't make sense, uh, that we would be able to isolate it. So I think he's trying to say, what if you gave a lot of energy yeah. and, yeah. So it, it, it's something else I totally sw swept under the rug. So, so you have three quarks and a proton, you, you pull one of them out, costs more and more energy, and there's more and more energy in this, this flux tube. At, at some point, what happens is there's so much energy in the flux tube that it's, it's energetically preferable to pop out of the vacuum a quark-antiquark -quark pair. And it snaps the flux tube in half, and then one of them pings back into the proton, and you've got a proton again, and then you're left with a quark-antiquark -quark combined here. So, so nature finds a way to get around this. Yeah, and, and I think Fayez Khan had a similar sort of thing. Why don't quarks exist alone? Why are they unstable, I guess? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. because they have to be attached to a flux tube, which has to go somewhere. Yeah. So we'll come back maybe to the question here. Uh, first, uh, the person on the aisle. Uh, so you talked about bringing in uh, statistics and probability distribution when talking about turbulence. Mm. So given that we uh, gather enough data and gather enough statistics, is there any way to uh, extract a law or something that can help us understand the cause of turbulence? That, I don't know about the cause of turbulence. The cause of turbulence is you push it too fast, and it, it may, yeah, maybe you mean what? How, why do you? How fast do you need to push it in order to? Uh, to well, th there's this intermediate regime that I, I didn't talk about about the onset of turbulence. That's also very complicated and, and confusing. So so here I was focusing just on the end point where everything is is, is crazy and turbulent. That there it's exactly what people are doing, trying to extract various laws. This area rule is one of them, but it's it's one of many. The, the, the problem is what you really want is a probability distribution for the fluid. But the fluid has an infinite number of variables. At every single point, there's a... Uh, so you're never going to get the probability distribution for a fluid by doing a few, a few measurements. So you know, that, that somehow would be a lovely solution to turbulence. What's the, what's the probability distribution for the fluid in turbulence? And we know some aspects of that through numerical simulations, um, but, but the full thing is, is eluded us. Hello, everyone. My, my question is, how does these quarks um, affect the protons or neutrons some, to their charge? Some more. Uh, affect the charge of the proton or neutron? Yeah. Oh, e each of the quarks has a particular electric charge. So there's also an electric force between the quarks, which, which I was ignoring. And I should try and get this right. The up quark has charge 2 thirds, and the down quark has charge minus 1 third. So if you have two up and a down, they add up to 1. That's the charge of the proton. One in units where the proton has charge one. Uh, and if you have two down and up, they add up to zero. So that, that's the neutron being neutral. Does electrons also have quarks? No, the, the electron is completely separate. So yeah, the fundamental building blocks of nature are, are two quarks, the up and down, an electron, and then a weird particle called the neutrino. And it's that collection of four come, come together. 
why is mainly quantum mechanics is based on possibility probability what, why is it based on probability it's the way nature is what, <laughs> what could i say <laughs> Uh, sort of a related question on the YouTube. Uh, Adesh Pandey uh, asked, do quarks follow Pauli exclusion principle? Uh, then he, is, uh, he doesn't understand how there can be two up quarks or two down oh, quarks. Oh, it's so good. Um, so yes, they, they follow the Pauli exclusion principle. Um, and the, the way this works is, is quarks have spin. Uh, um, and one of them spins this way and one of them spins this way. So actually they're in different quantum states. That, that, that's the way it works. So, so you can't put, one way of saying that this, this thing with three up quarks has, well, it, it's more complicated precisely because it, it, it obeys the Pauli exclusion principle. Yes, thank you. And uh, what happens if quarks and quarks maybe he meant quarks and anti-quarks. I, I don't know, quarks and quarks collide with each other. Also, if, if quarks and anti-quarks collide, they, they, like any particle and antiparticle, they annihilate in a burst of energy. But maybe he meant quarks and quarks. I mean, well, two quarks collide with the... Uh, uh, two, two quarks collide with enough energy, you create anything you like. That's, that's what happens in the LHC. You smash two protons together and just create all sorts of interesting and uninteresting things. <laughs> so... Hello. Yeah. So my question is. Uh, hello, sir. So my question is, uh, since there are three uh, quarks inside a proton or a neutron, so will the flux tube of two ups or will be equal to the flux tube of one up and down? And uh, the other part is that will the flux tube of one uh, oh, in any way overlap with the other inside a proton or a neutron? So, so the, the question is, if you have two ups and a down, yeah. are, are the flux tubes the same? Yeah. Yes, they, they're the same, yeah. Somehow they're flux tubes of, of the gluon field rather than associated to the quark itself. So the flux tubes are the same. And in fact, as we saw in this picture, they, they sort of merge. It's very poorly understood, I have to say, but the numerics show they, 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 they merge in this sort of Y-shaped tripod. But it's the same flux tube in both. And in any way, uh, will they overlap? Uh, at the junction where, where the three... Yeah. come together we don't really know what's going on there yeah that, that that's that's a puzzle yeah. was there a, a question there yeah good afternoon sir hello uh, uh, last time i guess a few years back you had given a lecture uh, from royal institute on quantum uh, field theory yes I there did. you had a mention you, you had a mention a problem on quantum field fluctuations so i wanted to know a bit more about that quantum field fluctuations that we cannot measure that you had told once. Oh, you, you might have to be a bit, a bit more specific, but that, yeah. that, that's really what this vacuum fluctuations that I showed here are. These are the quantum vacuum. You told that there was a problem in physics that we can't understand oh, that you, quantum field fluctuations. Do you remember which one? <laughs> a few years back. There's many. <laughs> Maybe come and chat with me later and we can, uh, uh, we can figure that out. Okay, on, on that corner over there, uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. So I was asking, uh, you, you, so you talked about that energy separation between this quark and anti-quark is proportional to R, right? Mm. Is it a numerical evidence or there are uh, it's established results from analytical calculations? I, I didn't because, understand it's proportional to R and then you asked. Uh, then is it a numerical evidence or it's like analytical calculations? Uh, have oh, no, it's, 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 it's entirely numerical evidence. No, because I'm saying if you consider the elastic energy between like, it's a proportional to X square, right? Square of the... That, that's ah. right. So it's not the same as a spring. That, that's right. It's not Hooke's law. Okay. It's proportional to R, not not to. So I mean, if you think like uh, when you it's like when you separate more, it, the energy like it, it should be more energy to put. I mean, it if takes you, if more you think... and more energy, which is the same as a spring, but but the force yeah. is constant. That that's something that's unusual. So for a, a spring, it costs more and more force to take them apart. For quarks, the force is constant, okay. but it just gets exhausted to keep holding against a constant force. The energy in, increases. Okay, yeah, thank and, you. and all of this is numerics. If you want to be, I was going to say rich and famous. If you want to be famous and not rich, you, you can solve this problem. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, 
uh, one more question from the Vanshika uh, uh, Rana asks, uh, you mentioned that wobbling in fluids can be seen as wobbling. I guess men, maybe you can visualize it. So can the turbulence evolution be seen as just time dependent perturbations? Oh, so yeah. To start with, to, to start with the fluid wobbles, and it, it wobbles a little bit, and when it's just wobbling a little bit, you can use what's called perturbation theory, precisely because the wobbles are, are small. But, but as those wobbles grow bigger and, and bigger, uh, th then we lose all control over what's going on. So what's called nonlinear effects in the equations are, uh, are, are what kicks in. So by the time you get to the turbulent regime, the, the wobbling and the perturbations is, is probably not the right way to think. And uh, in a quark-gluon plasma, what is the analog of pressure? And how are macroscopic quantities like pressure calculated for the, from the microscopic picture of quarks? And similarly, uh, um, the analog, is there an analog of incompressibility for the quark-gluon plasma? Oh, the, the, these are great questions. So I think the quark-gluon plasma is, is compressible, not incompressible. So you need some extra uh, e equation there. Um, uh, the, the analog of pressure is pressure, and it's, it's small and it's tiny, but nonetheless, it's, it's big enough to talk about macroscopic quantities. And, and how can it be calculated from the microscopic well, theory of Calculating course. it, we can't do. Measuring it from experiments, you can by just seeing how fast these things explode after they, they cool And down. some lattice gauge theory calculations, I think for static things like pressure, there, there's been some... Uh, it's hard because of the sign problem, so it's, it's really yeah, challenging yeah. to find identity. But, but, but this three-fourth, four-fifth kind of thing, I think uh, the, okay. there's probably some, but anyway. Um, okay. Uh, one question here, and then one there, and I think we will probably need to close after that. Mm. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my question was, uh, based on the question that was asked earlier about the quark-antiquark -quark pair uh, spontaneously forming, is it an instantaneous process, or does it have some delay where the quark can be said that it exists for a finite amount of time that it's It's you know, like everything in quantum mechanics, it's, it's probabilistic. So if, if you think about the decay of, say, a uranium atom, it's got a half-life of 80 years, whatever it is, but it doesn't mean it's definitely going to decay at, at that time. The, the same is true with pulling this apart. At every single point, there's a probability that the quark-anti-quark -quark pair will, will appear, but it's not guaranteed. The last question, I think, over there. Where are we? There's someone? Uh, Hi. Uh, uh, hello, sir. Uh, what my question was is basically you have you told that the quarks have charge so do they affect the gluon like uh, flux tubes uh, the lens of the flux tube like because you have your up as per two by three and the, no uh, the, the, the the electric charge is it, it's such a it, it, the electric charge and the contribution of the electric force which is also there between quarks it's so tiny compared to the strong force. Uh, and what about, because both uh, the gluon uh, flux tube and the quarks are a function of your probability function, wave functions, do they interact or are they independent or something? They all interact and they also interact with the electric field. Okay. But the electric field, because it's, you know, there's a number in physics, it's called the fine structure constant. It's a number that's roughly one over 137. Yes, sir. It tells you the strength of electricity and magnetism. But that's a very small number, and it's because it's small that somehow we can understand what, what we're doing. The analogous number for, for the strong force is one. Okay. So the strong force is, is 137 times stronger than electromagnetism in some sense. So it, it's dominating everything in the proton. Oh, thank you, sir. OK, uh, thanks very much. I'm afraid we uh, will have to close now, but uh, you can talk to David outside. Sir. No, I, I'm sorry, let's, uh, so I think we need... <laughs> No, no, c come and see me afterwards. And I'll, I'll, okay, I'll... so sure. Yeah, you, you can uh, talk to David outside. There's tea outside, enjoy. And uh, I'm sure you can mob David and ask him more questions. Uh, and please come back for the... And please come back on January 3rd uh, to hear about black holes, neutron stars, and all the exciting stuff happening in the cosmos.